A year ago today, I wrote an article titled The Largest Market Dislocation I've Ever Seen, and that was referring specifically to the Fed. Uh, it was shortly after SVB, just a few days after SVB happened. The market and market participants were clamoring for the Fed to end its hiking cycle, said the Fed had gone too far, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my analysis of Jerome Powell, listening to everything he said, listening to everything other Fed members said, was that uh, the Fed wasn't going to do that kind of shift, that they were going to stick to their dot plot, stick to their hiking cycle, despite SVB. And there was quite a large market dislocation between what the market was expecting and what the Fed, I thought, was going to end up doing and did end up doing. However, the market is up 30% since then, over 30% since then. And even this year, at the start of the year, the market was expecting six rate cuts. It has come down to three and nothing has basically happened. So uh, long story short, I think the Fed no longer has an impact on the stock market. There's a number of reasons for that. And I think they are legitimate, very legitimate reasons. Uh, earnings haven't deteriorated in any major way. Growth rates, yes, have definitely slowed down. At least that's my understanding of it. Um, but the economy has remained strong and earnings have remained relatively strong. We haven't seen the recession and the slowdown to the extent that I and others had expected. And that is reason enough for stocks to not necessarily collapse, so to speak, or anything like that. So... That's just the nature of the situation, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something to learn and take away from today's Fed meeting. I think that is definitely the case. Uh, whether or not the stock market cares is a whole nother question that I'm just not even going to go into with any degree of certainty because I've obviously been humbled in that and I'm very glad for that. I'm very glad for that humbling, for that experience. From that article to now, uh, I feel like my wisdom in investing has never been better. And I do think that my ability to invest for the long run is much improved. If you thought it was good before, I think it is phenomenal now. Uh, and I look forward to demonstrating that over time. So what actually occurred today? My read on what actually occurred today is that higher for longer for the foreseeable future is going to happen. Now, obviously, the stock market is green. Like I said at the beginning, stock market, Fed, who knows? You know, I, I don't... Mm-mm, mm-mm, okay? Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. I'm done with that. I'm done with that, okay? Whatever. Uh, the, the Fed did raise their year-end projections for 2025, 2026, and for the long run. And I think those are quite significant moves, particularly for the long run. Uh, there are a number of Fed members at 3% and above. And yes, the median didn't move, but the average moved quite significantly. And I think it's very clear that they are trying to signal something with that longer run shift. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing for stocks. If the economy remains strong, if earnings grow to an extent, that can overpower the effect of interest rates. But as Warren Buffett says, interest rates are like gravity on stocks. So I think there's something to think about. This video is not what everybody else is thinking about. This video is not about the consensus. This video is about what I'm thinking about, what I see, the signal that I take from all the noise. The signal I take is that interest rates are going to be higher than uh, they were. That is the thing. The thing is, we're going to have a higher neutral rate. That is my takeaway from today. I don't care that the QQQ is up. I don't care that the Russell's up. I don't care that the small banks are up. That's not what I see. What I see is interest rates are higher. I see REITs up. I don't think that's the right call. I think this is not very good for real estate. I think that we're going to have the fact that we're going to have higher interest rates is not good for real estate. If you understand the real estate picture, the idea, you know, we had the six rate cuts at the beginning of the year is that, oh, you just got to make it to 2025 
and then you can refinance at normal rates and you just 25 to survive, I think was the saying. If you bought something at a four cap, you're not getting that four cap again. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You're not getting four cap. You got to raise the rents. You got to do some value add to that property. Okay. That's just what it's going to be because you're not going to have a 3% neutral rate, a four plus percent 10 year and a six or 7% investment grade debt and a 4% property. The same thing goes for stocks. You know, the free cash flow yield of stocks is not that great right now. Uh, valuations are 30% above the average for the last two decades. That's not a great number if you're looking at the broad market. So with higher interest rates, with more powerful gravity, you know, at a broad level, things look a little dicey to me. You know, Warren Buffett is saying that the market is quite casino-like right now, more than it used to be in the past. Today's action, I think, proves him right on that. You see, I don't understand, you know, I don't care about one day's action, first of all. Second of all, I'm trying to disconnect the stock market from everything else, the broad stock market. And I just want to say this. I am fully long, okay? I'm fully long. Yes, I have like a 3% October hedge position, okay? Not such a big deal. It's 3%. It's not going to kill me. Okay, it's not going to kill me. Um, and I am long. But now more than ever, I think you have to be a stock picker. Because like I said, all these things I don't think bode well for assets in general. But you always want to own assets. You want to give up a pile of money to get a river of money. You want to have that cash flow. So give up the pile, get the cash flow. That's what you want to do. So I'm, I'm fully invested right now. Where am I fully invested? I am uh, fully invested in energy and tech. And we're going to get into that tech because I know that's what everyone wants to talk about, obviously. But I want to talk about the energy because obviously I've been talking about this for a while. Um, hold up, call coming in, declining that call. Sorry, fella. And uh, there are some finally things that are happening. So what happened in energy over the past few months? Well, at the end of the summer, the SPR ended and we finally saw a rally up until the middle of October, which if you remember, is when the Hamas terrorist organization did a grotesque terrorist attack and had the largest slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust, unprovoked. And for a few days, the price of oil continued to rise. It was up. And then all of a sudden, a narrative took hold that this didn't have any impact on the oil market. If you followed my Twitter, if you read my tweets, you'd remember on that Sunday after October 7th, on October 8th, we said we didn't think this impact impacted oil. So things came down to a higher low than the summer low. Since then, we have had a steady increase on what appears to be a supply deficit. That just seems to be the case. We're having draws. We're having consistent draws. We're at near record low global inventories. The EIA just flipped uh, in February from a surplus of the entire year. They are appearing to be bearish propaganda. Government bearish propaganda on energy prices um, to a, uh, a sur uh, deficit all year. And uh, these oil companies, U.S. oil companies, they're not having to cut production. If anything, they're slightly increasing production. They are buying back the stock so you own more of the wells. And we are at record United States gasoline consumption despite all the EV usage. And that is probably a bullish sign for oil consumption, particularly as the developing world, you know, roughly half the world's population just begins to like come off the zero mat, you know, obviously not totally zero, but in that way. So there are some rumblings of peak oil being pushed back even further into the 2030s. And we're obviously going to continue to experience growth until then. If you look at the JP Morgan forecast, 
we've got a problem because people don't want to invest. Necess- you need to spend a lot of money to keep your production levels the same. The desire to invest in new production is tapering off as we get closer to that peak oil level. As uncertain and debatable as it is, peak oil level. And I expect, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the next few months. I don't know what's going to happen in the next year. But over the next several years throughout the rest of the decade, it's going to be a very strong picture for oil. And even if we don't see higher than this price, the companies are going to buy back all the stock in a very reasonable amount of time frame. And your shares are going to go up a lot. But if the oil price does go up, that is obviously going to be accelerated even further. And it's highly questionable what is the oil picture in the long run. I believe in EVs. I would love to own a great EV. But there are a lot of uses for oil besides just gasoline. So we're not going to get into all that. But let's just say Warren Buffett in his shareholder letter said that like Coca-Cola and American Express, which he has owned for decades, he expects to hold Occidental indefinitely. So, he's the GOAT. You want to challenge the GOAT? Go ahead. Short Occidental. That's what he's saying. Okay, then, you know, Occidental isn't my favorite stock. I prefer Devon, which is a top five S&P 500 shareholder return company. But I do also own Occidental, just not as much as Devon. So there's, there's a lot of stocks in the space that I think are pretty good. And uh, I like the, the space for those reasons. However, I still have tech. Now, I said at the beginning, you know, it virtually seems to me like Mr. Market isn't out there making so many good deals. And I do think now more than ever, you have to be a stock picker. But I do think there are some good deals in the tech space. Uh, in the smaller growth company that has been obliterated since its IPO, since its SPAC, whatever it is. That is where I think there is tremendous opportunity. Now, I wouldn't make that your focus. I wouldn't take 10, 15, 20% size positions in those companies like I would with oil companies. I'm very comfortable with a 20% plus Devon Energy position. That's just the truth. I have a larger than 20% position in Devon Energy. I'm very comfortable with that. If I, you know, I, I, would, I would even be fine with it at 30 or 40 percent. These tech companies, the small tech companies, I would not do that with. I would say maybe 10 to 20 percent of your entire portfolio is enough to get tremendous gains on the ones you hit. In this space, you need to think like a venture capitalist. This is your opportunity as a uh, equity purchaser, public equity purchaser, to think and act like a venture capitalist with later stage companies that have some growth. And I think these valuations are quite attractive. Jumia, for example, is the largest online retailer in Africa. Now, there's a lot of risks associated with that. Africa is a very complex country, very complex transportation network, but they have a partnership with UPS. They're doing some things there. Um... So, you know, obviously there's concerns with the Nigerian currency, which has been a drag on that stock, but it's at this kind of price where I think it is reasonably attractive and you buy it as a small position and you intend to hold it for several years. This is not a trade. This is not a position that you can get scared out of if it falls 30%. You keep it small for that reason. So you can just stay in it um, and hold that stock. Uh the CRISPR companies. Healthcare is something like 20% of US GDP. CRISPR, I think, is going to be extremely disruptive to big pharma. Some of them have partnerships with CRISPR companies. Obviously, there's Moderna. But if they can take a percentage share of US pharma, and I do think they have a better product because US pharma is treatment over prevention, which you don't, nobody wants that. You want to be treated or prevention over treatment. CRISPR is treatment or prevention over treatment. Okay, CRISPR is the better solution to your health problem. That is the truth. It is the permanent solution to your health problem. It's not the drug you have to take for the rest of your life to do whatever. It is the 
change to the illness, to the disease, to the complication you have. That is what it does. And you want that fixed. You want to be fixed. You don't want to be continuously mended. So I think it's a very powerful technology that will generate tremendous returns for investors and deliver tremendous products for its customers. So I'm very happy to own those stocks. And I do think that is a fantastic deal. Mr. Market's given you pre-COVID levels. So much has happened in that space. We've proved the technology works since then. We're getting very close to commercial viability in sickle cell anemia, which affects something like one third or one eighth of all black people in the world. Pretty big deal, in my opinion. Finally, one more area, and this is going to be somewhat controversial, is China. Now, China, I'm not saying China is without problems. I think their biggest problem is their demographic problem. The fact that their population seems to be declining. That is, I have, I've yet to figure out how to deal with that as an investor. It obviously will affect the United States at some point. I don't know how that affects real estate and all these kinds of spaces. But China is, some of the valuations are very attractive. That's just the truth. I have one Chinese company, Jinko Solar. China has tremendous EV adoption. You see uh, BYD outselling Tesla last year. That is a tremendous feat. Clearly, China, that doesn't necessarily have the oil or the natural gas reserves that we do, is going to care a lot about having electricity that they can now have themselves. And Jinko Solar, I believe, is the largest Chinese solar company. Although I admit China is a little bit of a black box to me. And that is okay. You can accept a black box as long as that is in the price. And I very much view that is in the price with Jinko Solar. Um, so I, that, I think they're going to continue to buy solar panels, the government, from Jinko Solar. And that will be something that is uh, a very good cash flow. They pay a dividend. They're trading at a very low multiple. The stock is down a lot. Yeah, they had some margin issue with the recent earnings. I'm not buying this for one quarter. I'm buying this for a secular trend. So that's what I'm thinking. I think longer term, higher interest rates. I hope the market accepts that. I think stocks broadly are very expensive. I don't think Mr. Market's giving very good deals. But I think there are some good deals so now more than ever, we have to be stock pickers and very selective stock pickers where we are very confident in the quality of the deal. You can't go into a deal, I think. I think you have to, if the deal seems fair, I would stay away because the entire boat is at a high level. The whole idea, you know, you see who's swimming without pants when the tide goes out. The tide is very much in right now. The tide is all the way in. That's how I see it, okay? I view the tide as very much all the way in. So I'm just making sure I got my bathing suit on. That's it. I'm not shorting. I'm not doing anything too crazy. I'm all long, but I'm really making sure that bathing suit is on. Really making sure. So that's today's video, and until next time, peace out.